Hey guys, welcome to your second episode of Tool of the Week. This week, we're going to cover a tool called Jupyter Notebook. So you can think of Jupyter Notebook as basically a really fancy, um, programmable, interactive notebook. Now you can program this notebook in a variety of languages, although we're going to focus only on Python. Like most other software engineering tools, Jupyter Notebook is pretty complex, which means that it has a lot of features which means that it would take some time to learn all these features. Time is something that we don't have in just one video. So for the sake of time, what I'm going to be doing is presenting to you guys just the core components of this tool, just its most commonly used portions. By doing that, I hope that you guys will come out of watching this video with a solid foundation. You're going to be feeling competent, but not masterful. You know, you're going to be feeling like you're competent in using the tool, but not that you've mastered the tool. I'm hoping that it will then subsequently be very easy for you to master this tool because of the solid foundation that you'll come out of by watching this one video. So let's just go ahead and dive right in. Hey guys, welcome to your second episode of Tool of the Week. Let's go ahead and see what tool we're going to be covering this week. Ta-da! Um, <laughs> Jupyter Notebook. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, Jupyter Notebook is basically an interactive, programmable notebook into which you can put code, um, nicely formatted text, plots, images, videos, and even entire GUIs. It's very useful for uh, research in general, data science, which I guess could be classified as research, and um, as a general teaching and learning tool. All right, so the prereqs for this uh, video is you should have a general understanding of Python. And if you just know the basics of the command line, uh, that would be pretty helpful. But I would consider both of these to be pretty optional. And as always, um, throughout these videos, you should always check the description of each video um, to see if I have uh, any recommended resources on the prereqs. <clears throat> so what are we going to learn in this video? Um, well, we're going to learn how to launch a Jupyter Notebook, how to create a new notebook, how to... Uh, uh, I'm going to cover two tools that they have, the File Explorer and the Command Palette. They have a couple of other ones, but I find these to be the most uh, commonly used. We're going to then create cells. Uh, you're going to see these. They have code cells and markdown cells. I'll show you both of those. And in the process, I'm going to cover the basics of markdown, which is optional for you to watch if, you've all, if you're already familiar with Markdown. Uh, I'm going to cover something called Magix, which is a, a way of executing non-Python code inside the notebook. Then I'm going to show you how to plot and actually visualize the plot inside your notebook. And in the process, I'm going to cover the basics of, the mo of probably the most famous plotting library in Python called matplotlib. Um, then I'm going to talk briefly about uh, the tab complete parameter hint in the inspector window, uh, which are uh, coding aids. These are tools that the notebook offers to make your coding easier in that environment. Then I'm going to show you how to save your final notebook to a static HTML file that you can just give to anybody and as long as they have a web browser, they can open it. Then I'll upload your uh, Python notebook to GitHub and I'll show you that GitHub has a viewer for viewing a static version of your notebook. Then we're going to make a binder out of your GitHub uh, repository. This is a super amazing part. You're going to love this part. Um, this will basically allow you to send a shareable link uh, to people and when people view this link they can actually play with an interactive version of your notebook. And then last but not least, and this is a bonus, so therefore optional, uh, you can stick around to watch me create some uh, widgets, some GUI inside the notebook, which I find to be really amazing. Okay, so we're not going to get to the summary just yet. Let's go ahead and go back. All right, so to launch the notebook, um, you want to download... So first of all, I think we should back up a little bit and talk about how you get this tool. You can get the Jupyter Notebook... Um, through a tool called Anaconda. So if you just go ahead and launch your internet browser, let's see. So 
So just Google uh, Python Anaconda. Uh, I probably wouldn't just Google Anaconda by itself, just in case. Uh, just add Python in there. And then um, go to the first or second link, I guess. And then uh, you want to download Anaconda, right? So once you download and install that, what you'll end up having is um, something called Anaconda Prompt. Launch that. And you can just search uh, you know, for that program. Uh, if you just press your start menu and type in Anaconda Prompt, and I know you guys can't see this in the, um, the, the portion of my screen that I'm recording, but if you, if you just search for Anaconda Prompt and launch it, this is what you're gonna get, right? And this is how you launch the Jupyter Notebook. So uh, ignore the first thing that I do here. Completely ignore that, so you won't have to do this. Uh, just go ahead and change directories to a place where you want to create the notebook. I'm going to create it inside a specific YouTube folder that I have for all my YouTube tutorials. Uh, tutorials. Um, okay, so YouTube videos, tool of the week, uh, Jupyter Lab. So I'm going to change directories to my Jupyter Lab directory because that's where I want to create the notebook. And good. I'm going to leave this explorer open to see what we have in this folder. Oh, those things got to come back. Okay, so, all right, so, so far in this directory, all I have is a PowerPoint presentation, which I showed you earlier. But we're going to create a notebook in this directory as well. I'll move this out of the way for now. Um, all right, so with your Anaconda prompt, um, with the directory set to the place where you want to create the notebook, go ahead and type in Jupyter Lab. So Jupyter Lab is the uh, encompassing tool that includes a notebook. We're not going to talk about the lab too much. We're going to uh, focus specifically on the notebook. So launch Jupyter Lab, like so. Okay, so once it's launched, it looks something like this. And uh, I want to make sure that you guys can see this. So, okay, there we go. All right. So you're, this is the screen that you get once you launch Jupyter Lab. Now we want to create a notebook. So in the Launcher tab, just go ahead and click this uh, notebook. So we're going to create a Python 3 notebook. If you have a different version of Python, you may see something else. So it creates an untitled notebook. And this is what we're going to focus on. So if you have any of these sidebars open, so I have, for example, the command palette open, right now you can go ahead and collapse it by just clicking on it again. I do want to briefly cover a particular um, tool, the file browser. So this just shows you what's in that notebook, in that um, folder, right? Remember earlier we had this folder? Um, that's the folder that we changed directories to when we were in the command prompt, and then we launched the Jupyter Lab in that directory. If you recall earlier, I only had this PowerPoint presentation in that folder, and since we created a new notebook, it created this file dot ipynv that's the extension for the notebook you can ignore this folder up here and this file explorer is also showing you the same thing as you can see i have the powerpoint and the uh, actual untitled notebook let's collapse the file explorer okay so <clears throat> now it has automatically created a cell for us a cell is basically somewhere where you type either code or markdown i'll cover them both shortly. So for now, let's go ahead and um, this is a code cell. You can tell because when you have the cell selected, up here it says that it's code. That means you can type Python code here. So let's just type print hello and then to run it, do control plus enter. Or you can press this run button over here. Uh, as you can see, there's the output. So the output of the cell goes right below it. Now, uh, we also have markdown cells. Let's go ahead and change the type of this cell to markdown. You can do it by the GUI over here, or when you have the cell selected, you can just press M. I like the keyboard shortcut. Okay, so once it's markdown, now we can put markdown syntax. And markdown is just a plain text that some viewers can format and make look uh, nice, make it look like rich text almost. So I'll show you. So it, we can do something like, in Markdown we have headings, right? So we can do heading one. Oops. All right, there we go, and it looks like that. 
All right, let's cover the basics of Markdown while we're at it anyways. Um, but first, let me just show you the code cell. Uh, let me uh, leave the code cell there. So we have a code cell and we're gonna print hello. We're gonna leave it there. We're gonna create a new cell below it. You can do that two ways. Either click this plus icon over here, which says insert cell below, or you can press B on your keyboard, which will insert a cell. And by default, it makes it a code cell. So let's go ahead and switch it to a markdown cell. All right, now it's a markdown cell. Let's, I'm gonna use markdown to explain the basics of markdown. Now, if you already are very familiar with markdown, go ahead and skip this section. I'll post a button on your screen that you can click to skip past this section. But here's the basics of markdown. It's a, a, an easy way for you to specify a bit uh, like formatted text, I guess, uh, text that looks good whether it's rendered by a markdown renderer or if it's just plain text. I think the sometimes examples speak much louder than you know words or descriptions. Let me just show you. So we're gonna title this section um, Markdown Basics. Okay, and I'll show you. See that? If you put the hashtag in, it creates it a heading one, which is big text essentially. Um, all right. So the basics of Markdown, that's heading one. You already know that, right? This is heading two. Three hashes is heading three. Each, each of these he uh, headings get a little bit smaller. Let's view it. Again, you can run a cell by uh, either clicking the Run button up here or doing Control Enter. So this is what the Markdown looks like when it's rendered by a Markdown renderer, I guess. Okay. You can also... Um, create a paragraph, so this is a paragraph, this is another paragraph, see what that looks like, just like that. You can create ordered lists, so uh, unordered lists, let's create that first. This is an unordered, I'm sorry if my keyboard is a little bit too loud, I, I hope that's not bothering you guys too much. Okay, so item one in the list, item two, item three. Notice that I do a dash and then a space and then the item, right? Let's see what that looks like. Like that. So it's a bullet. An unordered list is also called a bullet. This is an ordered list. Similar, you just do like the number. So one and then a period and then space and then the item. Item one, item two, and item three. Let's see what that looks like. Just like that. Uh, we can also put code, uh, formatted code, into our markdown. So this is how you put inline code. So let's say that this inline thing was a fragment of code. Let's see what it would render. Looks like that. Very nice. And then this is <laughs> this is how you put an entire code block. So you just do these tilde characters, and then you put the extension of the language. So Python, the Python language, its files use the .py extension, right? You wanna make sure that you also, on the bottom, put the same number of tildes, and then inside those, um, you put your code. So we'll do hello, print hello, and then there. Let's see how it renders this. There we go, the entire code uh, block. Okay, uh, we can also put links and images. So this is how you uh, link, right? So if you, let's say that this word over here, I want it uh, to hyperlink to something. You surround it with brackets, and then in parentheses, you put the address. So I'm going <laughs> to put it on my crappy website. It looks pretty bad right now, but I have a website called abdulnotes.com. Hmm. Oh, not Abdullah Notes, abdullahsnotes.com. Looks really bad. I'll, I'll work on it someday. <laughs> but anyways, all right, so let's link to my crappy website. Um, you put the address right here, and there you go you can see that there's a link created and look on the bottom left and you'll see that it says it goes to Abdul's notes. I'm not gonna click it yet. All right, and you notice that I'm editing the cell by double clicking on it or I can just press enter. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you how to put images in Markdown. This is an image. 
Okay, um, it's similar to a link, so brackets. And then instead of putting the text that you want hyperlinked, what you put is an alternate text. Now the alternate text is the text that's displayed when the image cannot be uh, retrieved, right? So I'm just gonna call it alternate text. And then in parentheses, you put the link to the image. We'll go ahead and use this handsome guy over here. Um, okay, so copy image address and put it right there. Okay, and then after the address of the image, you put a space and in quotes, you can put hover text. So this text will appear when you hover, why did I put a space there, over the image. So you can specify what text will appear when you hover over the image, and that's how you do it. Let's see how this is rendered. Ooh, alternate text, I guess it couldn't find the image, that's interesting. Make sure I did it correctly. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. You wanna um, pre-print this entire thing with an exclamation mark. That's what makes it an image. There you go. Okay, so that's the basics of Markdown. Now we're gonna move past that. Let's go ahead and insert a cell below this. You can either click this button up here again, or you can just press the B button. And remember, by default, these cells begin as code cells, not markdown cells. All right, now I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna um, explain to you magic. So notice that when we have a code cell, we type in Python in it, right? Such as print pi. And it executes the Python and displays the output below. In addition to executing Python code, you can also execute what are called magics. And magics are just non-Python statements that do something else. So for example, uh, one example of a magic is the um, load magic, right? If you use the load magic and then you do a path to a Python file to something.py. So if I really had this Python file, right, it would actually take the content of that Python file and paste it into this cell. So they're kind of like things that do, uh, cool utility things. Um, some common magics that you might use is like, I guess, uh, let's see, ls, which displays the contents of the directory. Echo, which is just like the echo command. And there's a couple more useful ones. But there is a particular magic that we need to use in order to enable a plot to be generated in the note. So we're gonna cover that when we learn how to plot, which is right now. So let's go ahead and change this to markdown and plotting. We're gonna cover plotting right now. Okay, so we wanna import matplotlib.pyplot as plt. That's what we're gonna use as our plotting library. Uh, and then we have to use the matplot lib uh, inline magic. This basically means I want the matplotlib graphics to be inside the notebook. We're gonna execute that and add a cell right below it. Now let's go ahead and create a plot. So, all right, so let me now quickly cover the basics of um, matplotlib. Uh, well, first of all, let me just show you a plot uh, in case you're already familiar with matplotlib. I don't want you to have to listen to that if you're already familiar to matplotlib. So let me quickly show you a plot. So I'm going to plot this basic line. There you go. That's it. That's how you do it. <clears throat> okay, so for those of you who are unfamiliar with matplotlib, I'll cover it quickly right now. I have some nice notes on it. So first of all, you need to understand the structure of how plots and figures and stuff work in matplotlib. So at the highest level, you have a figure. And a figure can actually have several plots in it, right? But these plots are called um, axes. That's what, what it's called in Matplotlib's terminology. So inside a figure, you, have, you can have several axes, and each of those axes can have several lines, as you can see. We have the red line, the blue line, and the uh, black line. That's how the structure is. And then um, you, there's also the concept of a current figure and a current axis. So whenever you plot things in matplotlib, it plots into your current axes, which is inside your current figure. To get the current axes, 
you can do plt.gca function to get the current figure. You can do plt.gcf function. Those aren't important. You don't have to worry about those much. But just know that there's a current figure at all times and a current axis. And when you call the plot functions, um, they operate on your current axis. All right, so let's go ahead and do a quick example. So we'll do plt.figure. This is going to create a figure and set it as the current one. Plt. Now we're going to plot onto this figure. It has a if it doesn't have a default axis, one will be created for you. So we'll use the plot function, and you can pass in an x vector and a y vector. So we'll pass in one, two, three, four, and just one, two, three, four. So just a line with a slope of one, and um, we're going to give this a label. So we're going to call this line. And let's see what it looks like. Just like a line. OK, good. Now, on the same axis, we're going to go ahead and make another line. So we'll do, again, for the x values, 1, 2, 3, 4. And this time, we're going to make it quadratic. So for the y values, we'll make 1, uh, 4, 9, 16. And we're going to label this as quadratic and there you go so since we've labeled both of our lines I can actually do plt that legend to also oh, not legend legend to display a legend on that axis there we go in order to change the X label or the Y label you can do plt that X label I'm just gonna call it X label because I'm not a very creative person apparently um, and then I'm going to call this, I'm going to also change the Y label to just Y label. And let's go ahead and change the title of this plot to X versus Y. Super creative. Okay, so that's basically the basics of uh, Matplotlib. Alrighty. Um, now let's. Uh, now I'm going to show you how to save this uh, uh, this notebook to a static HTML file. Well, before that, actually, let me really quickly show you guys something super cool. So I want to show you um, like the parameter hints, right? So let's say I want to use the dot figure function, right? If you while your cursor is inside the parentheses of this function, if you press Shift and Tab, so hold Shift, press Tab, it pops up this parameter hint. It's basically the documentation of the function. It shows you the signature and the description of each parameter, as, along with some examples. And uh, you can also view the code inspector, and that will show you these things at all times. So if you go to the command palette, which is right over here, and you type in inspector, open inspector, this is the inspector. You can dock it to one side and watch what happens in the inspector as I code. See, as I code, it gives me hints about what I've just typed in. I don't want to use it right now so because I have limited screen real estate. So I'm going to get rid of it. But I've also now shown you the command palette. Uh, so any commands that you can do in the notebook, like exporting or opening certain windows, just I think the easiest way to get to them, as long as you know their name, is to just go to the command palette and search for it. So right now, we want to export, right? So search for export. Let's export our notebook to HTML. And there we go. It exported it to a .html. Let's open that up. And here's a static version of that notebook that we just created. You can give this HTML to anyone that has a web browser, and they can view it. Let's get rid of my crappy website here. All righty. Now, you can also just straight up upload your dot um, .ipynb uh, file extension, which is the extension for the actual notebook. You can upload that to GitHub, and GitHub has a viewer that will show you. So you don't have to upload your static HTML to GitHub. <clears throat> you can actually upload the um, this file over here. So that's, that's what I'm going to do right now. Uh, so let me just go to my GitHub. <clears throat> Excuse me. Alrighty. Um, oh, I'm already logged in. So I'm going to, oh no, I'm not logged in. What was I thinking? 
So me like you code. And I'm gonna block out my password so you guys don't know it. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna create a new repository. And I'm gonna call this uh, test repo. Oop, I guess I already have it. So we're gonna call this Jupyter test repo. Public, we're gonna initialize a readme. I'm gonna create the repository. Let me just go ahead and upload my notebook file in there. So let me choose the file. So I saved it inside my YouTube videos, Tool of the Week, Jupyter Lab, right over here. All right, so I'm gonna say add notebook, that's what I did. Commit this to the master branch. <clears throat> Now let's, so if you go click on the file, the notebook file in GitHub and watch, GitHub will actually render it for you. It just takes a little bit of time, I guess. There it is. Okay, so now this is still not the cool part. The coolest part is, is that you can actually distribute um, a, an interactive version of your notebook. So I guess the obvious way of distributing an interactive version of your notebook is to take this, um, uh, dot .ipynb file, right, the notebook file, and just give it to somebody who also has the Jupyter Notebook on their computer and they can just run it like you. But there's an easier way. You can actually have, you can actually just send them a link and they'll be able to play around with your notebook live, change it, and, and run the code. And you use a tool called Binder. So once you have made a GitHub repository and uploaded your notebook file, just Google um, Jupyter Binder. Go to the first link, and now just uh, copy a link to your repository. So I'm gonna go back to the main repo page. Copy that and put it over here, and then specify the mass, the branch that uh, your uh, notebook is in. Mine is in master. And then click this launch button. Uh, and this will basically, uh, it will give you a link that then you can give to people. And when people visit that link, they can play around with your notebook. So there's one step that I skipped. There's one additional file that you have to upload to your GitHub before you click this launch button. And that's an environment file. The environment file basically tells Binder what version of Python and what libraries they need in order to make your notebook interactive. So let's go ahead and create an, an environment file real quick. So you know, launch v VS Code here. I'm gonna create a new uh, a new file and, and specify my dependencies. This is the syntax for the environment file. Um, one of the dependencies that I have is um, simpy, and another one is Let's change language mode to YML, YAML. Okay, so we have Simpy and Matplotlib. Actually, I don't think we're using Simpy at all. We're just using Matplotlib. So we're gonna save this. I'm gonna put it in my Jupyter Lab notebook and I'm gonna call it, call it environment, environment.yml. Save it. Alrighty, and upload that file to your GitHub in the root directory. So add environment file. So we got our notebook and our environment file, and our environment file says we need matplotlib. Let's go ahead and launch this binder tool and then let's copy this link. So this is the link that you can share with people and that'll let them play with an interactive version of your notebook. This might take a little bit of time, so I'm gonna cut this loading for you. Okay, so once Binder has finished building everything, it should automatically redirect you to this page. If it hasn't redirected you to this page, you can just paste that link that it gave to you. Um, so once you're at this page, you know, this is the link that you share with people. Now people can actually, uh, 
basically open up your notebook file. So if they just click your notebook file, there we go. They now have a live version of your notebook. So let's edit one of these cells. Um, let's print it works. And there we go. Everything works. The plots work. Let's rerun this just to make sure. Oh, well, yeah, we got to run everything. So um, if we want the plotting to work, we execute this, we execute this, and there you go. So now I'm going to go over widgets. So let's leave all of these. All right. Change it to markdown. We're going to cover a bonus, uh, a bonus topic, widgets. This is how you make GUI in the notebook. This is entirely optional. You can skip this portion, but be sure to watch the summary because I think summaries are really important. So I'll post a little button on your screen that will skip you to the summary if you don't want to watch this. But I think this is a really, really cool section and I, and I encourage you to watch it. So a widget, uh, widgets is how you basically create a GUI interface in your notebook. I think I often think that examples speak a lot louder than words, so let me just show you. Um, first of all, what you want to do is create an output widget. An output widget is something that you can print text to and also display things like plots, images, videos, and, and other stuff. So it can accept rich media, not just text, but it's some place where you can output stuff. So I'm going to call this output widget. Well, first of all, let's import um, IPI widgets as widget. Uh, let's call it widgets, I guess. Um, and then we're going to create an output widget. And let me just show you the output widget really quickly. Well, oh, and uh, I should mention this, but if you just uh, like if you just put the uh, a variable like this, it will call display on it automatically. Basically, this is what it's doing, right? Um, so the display will will basically display the richest version of that variable. So this widget variable has a really rich representation, not just text. You know, it, it, so you'll you'll see it over here. Um, so that's being displayed. The output is being displayed right over here, and now we're gonna put stuff in that output. So how do you put stuff in the output of the output widget? Well, you do. You use the context manager, so with output widget, um, print high. And now look, you remember normally the output of a cell became underneath it, but right now I'm printing to the output of the output widget, right? That's the widget up here. So it should be up there. That's where it should print. Run it. There we go. So you can write stuff to the output widget. Now the cool thing is, is that I don't have to just write text, right? I can write plots. So let's do, um, we'll plot uh, one, two, three. We'll just make a basic plot. Kill to that show. See, that goes up there too in the output widget. So you can put text, you can put plots, you can put images, a lot of rich media in the output widgets output section. So now we have an output widget. Let's create a function um, that clears and then put something in there. So we're going to create some function. This function takes some data, right? And it'll just print that data. Okay, that's all it does. It it, um, it will will it will this function will clear the output widget first, and then with the output widget. And we'll print the data. So what this function does is it takes some data, it uh, clears anything that's in the output widget, and then inside the output widget it prints the new data, right? So you can think of it as this function replaces whatever output is in the output widget with new output as specified by this data variable. Um, let's go ahead and test this function. So We'll put three in there. As you can see, it cleared the plot and put three. Um, now, now we're going to create a control, an input widget, I like to call it. So we're going to create a slider here. Um, 
So I'll call it slider widget. I'll create an ink slider. Um, if you bring up your parameter hints by pressing shift and tab, you can see that it has a min, max, and a step. Those are pretty uh, self-explanatory. The minimum value of the slider, the maximum value of the slider, and the step size of the slider. How, you know, how big of values does it increment by? So min will create zero, max will create 10, and step will make one. And now let's just display this. Here's what it looks like. Okay, so now we have a slider. Now, every time that this slider changes, we want to call this function, right? Because this function will basically spit in the output widget. So the way we do that is slider widget dot observe. Okay, bring up your parameter hints. And now handler is the function that we want to call. And the second parameter basically says that whenever the value of this control changes, call this function. There's one final change that we have to make to our function. Instead of just printing the data, we get data.new. Because as the slider changes, what is passed to this function is an object that has a new and an old value. So the old value of the slider and the new value of the slider will be passed to the function. We want to print the new value. Let's go ahead and see if this works out. Well, let's change our code and watch what happens. So you can see that as I change the slider, make sure you're looking up here, okay? I'm changing the output of that widget. So by using some input widgets and output widgets, you can create um, GUIs effectively. Now there is an easy way to do this, and um, this is called the interact function. So let's just say that I have a function that takes some value and it just prints that value, right? That's all it does. If I want to make that function interactive, basically all I do is widgets dot interact and I bring up the parameter hints and let's see I'm for the function I want f and then for the variable x I want to make a slider that will adjust it. So I'll create a int slider and I'm going to leave the default and let's see what happens. So this will do everything that we did up there manually. It will create an output widget down here and it will attach the callback to that function and it will take its output and put it in its output widget. So watch. Keeps on calling our function up there. Okay, so that's it. That's all I wanted to cover for the Jupyter Notebook. I hope that you guys realize the usefulness of this tool. Let's go ahead and summarize really quickly. All right, so we covered all those topics. All right, um, so the Jupyter Notebook is basically an interactive programmable notebook. It's very useful for research, data science, and for teaching and tutorials and learning, and just playing around with Python. So in, in this rich interactive notebook, you can include a lot of things. You can include executable code. Um, you can include uh, you know nicely printed mathematical expressions and stuff. If you use Simpy, which I have another tool of the week episode on, if you want to view that, you can put Markdown, which as I stated earlier, is just a like a easy way to format text, I guess. Um, you can put videos and you can put straight up HTML in this uh, notebook. You can put plots using matplotlib. Um, but uh, if you're working with data science, you probably want to use Seaborn or ggplot. And you can even put uh, GUIs inside this notebook. Uh, you can export the notebook to a static HTML, which you can distribute. That's a boring one. You can upload the actual notebook file to GitHub and GitHub will display a static version of it for you. Still kind of boring. This is the cool part. You can make a binder from that GitHub repo and that will give you a link that you can then share with people and when they go to that link, they can play with an interactive live version of your notebook. And that's the really cool part. So that's a summary. Okay, and that's the end of this video. It was a little bit longer than I had anticipated, but that's because I covered the basics of Markdown and the basics of uh, matplotlib. If you skip those two sections, it should have been pretty short. As usual, I would really appreciate feedback. 
Um, but first of all, if you have any questions, of course, you can post. I'm pretty fast at getting back to you. But um, particularly feedback, I do really appreciate because I don't know how I'm doing unless somebody tells me, you know. So in particular, did I go too fast? Did I go too slow? You know, did I talk too fast? Did I talk too slow? Was I covering content too fast? You know, was it too slow? Stuff like that. Did I go into too much details into certain things or not enough details? Was I too redundant? Again, I would like to make this note about redundancy. I often like to repeat myself in different ways because I feel like I don't expect you to listen to every single word that comes out of my mouth super carefully because I will never repeat myself. The really important things I will repeat several times just in case you missed it once. But if you know I'm overdoing it, let me know. Uh, and then last, uh, if this series interests you, as I mentioned before, you know, tools, which is what we're covering once a week in the series, they're at the cornerstone of software engineering. They're extremely important. If you want to be a good software engineer, you really have to know a large amount of tools. Um, you don't have to be a master at every single one, but you have to know about their existence and their basics. Uh, so if that interests you, uh, you can subscribe and then also click the bell icon so then you're notified whenever I upload a new video in this series. And last but not least, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. I enjoy making these videos, um, especially the this series, uh, the Tool of the Week series. So I hope that you guys enjoyed watching this as much as I enjoyed creating it. Thank you, and I hope to see you in a subsequent video. Bye-bye.